Hey guys, Ben here from United Yacht Sales and welcome back to my channel. As you can see based on the background, I am in fact quite high off the ground right now. That is because today we are talking about flybridges. Interesting stuff, right? Well, uh, love them or hate them, these days they're becoming more and more the standard for many cruising catamarans over 60 feet and uh, plenty that are even under that range. And there's a good reason for that. They make sailing ergonomics a lot easier, it's a great place to hang out, and quite frankly, just adds more space to your boat. But the introduction of flybridges was not a very, has not been a very uh, even process. A lot of brands were very gung-ho, jumping on the flybridge bandwagon, while others were pretty recalcitrant and quite frankly still are. But today I want to discuss the topic of how exactly did flybridges come to be? Who first got the idea to put one of these on a catamaran? What exactly was the first catamaran to have a true God to honest flybridge? Uh, how exactly might one be able to find this out? Well, uh, typically, you know, in a, in a sort of case like this, sometimes you can just do a quick Google search and you'll find articles talking about all sorts of yachting innovations, you know, or sort of listicles about, you know, X biggest sport fishers or other sort of things. But uh, this question is a bit too esoteric. It's a bit too specialized and there really isn't an easy answer that you're just going to be able to grab off of a search engine. So instead we're going to switch, we are going to reach for the handy dandy yacht broker Swiss army knife, the Sold Boats database. All right, now what exactly is this Sold Boats thing I keep mentioning? Well, basically if you pay for it, it just allows you to see archived but not withdrawn Yacht World listings. Ostensibly, the main purpose is to provide clients with up-to-date information on the selling prices of like yachts, but I mean, you can use it for all sorts of interesting things. Uh, you can estimate past production volumes on boats if the data isn't readily available. Uh, you can probe for the timing of future charter company listings. You can even track individual yachts as long as the listing broker correctly records the name over time. So yes, it's a pretty neat tool, though it's not exactly a crystal ball. There are some limitations. First, it only goes back to the year 2000 or so. Second, it only records boats from brokerages that actually use the Yacht World MLS. And believe me, there are brokerages that straight up just do not use that. That, however, is a story for a different video. And third, sometimes brokers, much to my chagrin, omit certain sales if the client requests so for a reason. So it's not perfect, but in situations like these, I'm often reminded of the old joke regarding the drunk guy looking for his keys. A man is walking down a street and spots a guy digging through some snow. He stops and asks, what are you looking for? The man says, I lost my keys. The other man says, well, where'd you lose them? He says, in the alley over there. He says, well, why are you out on the street? The man responds, well, this is where the light is. So getting back on track here, what exactly was the first catamaran to have a flybridge? Well, you might be tempted to say the Lagoon 440, or maybe actually the Leopard 62. And those are both good answers, but they're not the real ones. Lagoon 440 was the first catamaran to have a flybridge under 50 feet. And the Leopard 62 was the first production boat to have a flybridge. But they're not actually the first boats to have flybridges. Doing this search is actually pretty simple. We're just going to use the keyword flybridge and then filter by class catamaran, class multi-hole, and then sort by the year oldest. And voila! The answer is obviously the Leopard 62, the Leopard 62, and the Leopard 62. Yep, everything looks good, except for this intruder at the top of the list. Or is it just an error of some kind? Well, no, and even though there are plenty of errors in the Sold Boats database, garbage in, garbage out, but this isn't it. The first catamaran in the world to use a true God to Honest flybridge was actually made in 1991 and was done in aluminum. Yup. As such, I went on to do some more research only to discover that actually this boat is back for sale on the market today. And the listing agent, Alexi, was gracious enough to provide me with some updated photos of her condition so that we can examine her more thoroughly in detail. I also emailed him regarding this whole mini quest I was on just to confirm that this wasn't a, you know, later edition that another owner welded on top of the previous boat. And he could confirm that yes, back in 1991, at La Rochelle, he saw the boat new at a boat show. Well, 30 years later, he's now in charge of selling the boat. Time is indeed circular. Also, as much as I'd like to show you some God to Honest actual footage instead of photos, this boat is in France and I am 
decidedly not. So this will just have to be the format going forward. Not much can be done about it. It's just the nature of the beast. As a side note, this boat was done in aluminum, which is not unheard of for a catamaran, but it is a bit strange. There are some interesting designs, the majority of them Australian, that actually specify the use of aluminum, but this is outside the scope of this video. And we'll get to the topic another day. In the meantime, if you want a better idea of what exactly goes into an aluminum catamaran, I suggest you check out this tour of the Tim Mumby Cyber 48 by the catamaran Jupiter 2 and their channel in general. It's good stuff. Or check out Garcia Yachts, since they seem to be pushing a new line of aluminum catamarans as well these days. Alright, so getting down to brass tacks, the boat we're talking about today is currently christened the Lady Paca. It's a 74-foot semi-custom built in France. I think there were a couple others built around the same time. Not sure what's happened to them. But yeah, at, a, at 74 feet, it's a big boat, and I think back in the early 90s, that was just positively ginormous. I mean, uh, large, the market for large catamarans is not what it was today, 30 years ago. Examining the flybridge, which is what I originally came for, it's pretty similar actually to the Leopard 62. You have kind of a recessed helm area, and then the rest of the deck is aft of that. But it is a pretty big deck. You know, it's not like a, a sort of a fancy flybridge like we see on this sun reef, but uh, it's more like bring your own furniture and chill there. But you can definitely see the genesis of the idea, which is where it counts. So heading down cockpit-wise, it's also pretty interesting as well. You've got these nice sort of solid beams holding up the flybridge that make up the hardtop. And it, it is really interesting to think that this boat is almost kind of like a proto sunreef, which is pretty insane when you think about it, because sunreef wouldn't exist until at least about a decade after that boat was built. And sunreef also did start out building in aluminum as well, although I think quite wisely they've switched to uh, more standard composites. So on the interior, things get a little interesting because you have nine, yep, count them, nine cabins. Uh, I don't have a layout diagram, so apologies for that, but the way I've heard the layout described, it's you have two cabins forward, then four cabins on the other side, three on the other, and a galley down. So the boat can sleep up to 19 passengers, which is pretty cool. So yeah, given that this is a, intended to be a professional crewed yacht, it is galley down, so all of the current seating in the salon area is dedicated to uh, settees and such. As far as the actual interior condition, I think it's pretty much going to be a complete remodel job. Um, the interior is pretty old. It basically needs to be ripped out and redone. One good thing about this boat being aluminum is that you do have a lot of freedom in rearranging the non-structural stuff. If you don't like something, basically just cut it and weld new stuff. I mean, uh, you could really go wild with the interior of this boat. You could get rid of a couple of cabins and make like a big owner suite or add like a galley up. Um, you know, it is going to cost you a pretty penny, but uh, the way I'd like to think of boats like these is that it's really more of a blank canvas. Uh, you can just sort of make it whatever you want and not feel too bad about ripping out anything fancy. As far as the condition of the boat's remaining core systems, uh, I do trust my colleague to represent the boat honestly. He's a good guy. And uh, it's pretty much going to need new engines, new batteries, new gen sets, uh, I mean, new sails. Basically, all of the core systems are going to need to be replaced. And as is inevitable, plenty of other things will come up as well once you start taking things apart. Still, I, I don't dislike the boat. I think for someone who's looking for like an expedition yacht that doesn't necessarily have all of the, you know, the fanciest bells and whistles, it could be an interesting project. Certainly, I need someone who can appreciate sort of the history of the boat and doesn't mind owning what is basically a classic performance cruiser. And specifically as a broker, when I when I have to, you know, make a judgment call about, you know, what what it kind of boat am I looking at based off of photos alone, I want to look for certain indicators of quality like uh, you know, full stainless steel winches, full stainless steel wheel, nice sturdy crossbeam, uh, you know, good solid supports for the hard top as I previously mentioned. How easy is it to access the engine room? That sort of thing. Now, I'm not recommending this as an actual offer for the boat, but theoretically, if you paid in and around the neighborhood of half a million dollars for the boat, I would say set aside at least 100% of the purchase price to be put toward refit costs, at least for basic seaworthiness. Perhaps maybe another 100% of the purchase price for quality of life upgrades. The way at least I think about this is that 
the total replacement cost of this boat new would probably be around $3 million. So if you can rebuild the entire boat for less than 50% of that price, then I think it's probably worth it. If not, might as well buy something newer. And yes, for reference, I do know of remodel projects of this size and scope which have been done successfully before. I know a surveyor who recently finished up a complete remodel of a classic Kong and Halverson motor yacht of similar length. It turned out really neat where you have kind of like a nice classic yacht look on the outside, but it's just completely new on the inside. Now, as you'd imagine, most yacht brokers would rather sell their clients a million dollar boat than a half a million dollar boat that needs an additional $500,000 in refit costs. After all, you only get paid on the initial sum. But of course, despite having multiple multi-million dollar clients who undoubtedly follow my channel and my advice to a T, I'm taking one for the team here and we're talking about this boat anyway. Just because, well, I want you to be entertained as well as informed. As far as what you could actually use a completely refitted yacht like this for, well, could run uh, sort of charters in really sort of remote expedition style locations, or you could just use it as your own yacht and sail around the world in comfort. Also, a big shout out to George from David Walters for letting me borrow this puppy as a shooting location. I think it helps add to the production value, and I think it's fitting since the Sunreef 62 is sort of the spiritual successor of the boat we're talking about today. It was one of the first Sunreefs ever designed and built. All right, so that's gonna wrap it up for this video. Uh, unless someone wants to come forward with an even weirder catamaran that predates this one, uh, I think that's going to close the books on that question. Uh, as always, thanks for watching. If you like the video, please leave a like. If you dislike the video, leave a hot dislike. Uh, leave a comment, and if possible, please consider subscribing to my channel. It really helps out. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.